Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Shadow and Sun Show, and welcome back to another Advanced Dungeons and Dragons review, I guess. Today I'm going to be talking about the Unearthed Arcana, and why I believe it is indirectly, if not directly, responsible for the formation and creation of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 2nd Edition. A lot of people, um, uh, real quick, this is a reprint copy from Drive Through RPG. Um, not not bad. Um, I actually really like it. Uh, the the cover and stitching appear to be really really solid, which is one of the huge issues the original Unearthed Arcana had. My my copy of the original fell apart within about a month. It was so poorly stitched together that um, it, it's a miracle there are any out there still surviving intact and why it still you know draws about a 50 to a 75 dollar price tag for a good copy of the original this one right here from drive through cost me about 30 bucks i think with shipping so i'd go with this one but right off the bat i got this book when it first came out and my friends and i we absolutely loved it now there's a lot of things that that people were not happy about more so as the years went on as opposed to initially because every player just absolutely loved a bunch of the things I'm going to talk about real quick but right off the bat the increased character race limitations that were increased quite significantly were were better for the overall game uh, there was nothing worse than having a, a non-human character max out long before the campaign was to end and just be stuck at 6th or 7th level when everybody else is going up to you know 8th, ninth, 10th and even higher potentially um, so the increased uh, level limitations was nice and as you know most of you know later on down the road in other editions those limitations were eventually just uh, discarded uh, mostly because of player demands that their characters could continue on as characters and not just suddenly have to retire because humans were better at everything, which um, I'll probably go into at some later point, but I, I totally disagree. I think it's just the opposite, in fact, that most of the uh, demi-humans, we'll call them, were better at some things than humans. Um, just straight up, that those are just facts um, that, that, you know, most people don't want to admit to they weren't better at everything uh, and, and human strengths eventually probably allowed for them to to survive as a species longer but like I said that's a topic for another discussion let's start with the new professions the cavalier while some people thought it was a little too powerful um, it really wasn't much different than the regular fighters with weapon specialization all theirs were just uh, uh, predetermined uh, as it were they had to specialize at certain levels with certain weapons whereas the human uh, uh, regular fighters and rangers had a little bit more leeway i absolutely love the paladin being a subclass of the cavalier i always thought of paladins as more of knights than just wandering fighters with certain abilities the druid editions were absolutely wonderful in my opinion mind you these are all opinions and their increased level abilities after 12th or 15th i forget what it was were just just a lot of fun if you could ever get there now mind you most druids should you know really never get to the upper limits just because of you know, you'd have to really play your characters quite a bit to get to that point. Now, here comes the biggie, uh, as per the title that I talked about. The weapon specialization is, I think, one of the key factors that led to the ultimate creation of 2nd edition AD&D. Uh, because of the, uh, the additional damage and attacks that fighters could get, it made all of the monsters in the monster manual that much weaker. I understand that fights and combats should not take long, long, drawn-out sections of your gaming day, but this this lessened 
that to to you know mere minutes with a couple of competent fighters or rangers even paladins and, and cavaliers uh with with their increased attacks the, just those, those the math was just not figured in to the original monster manual they it, the monster manual was designed with the way fighters used to attack in the player's handbook and that was it so when the weapon specialization rules came out it weakened all of the monsters in the old monster manual monster manual 2 and the fiend folio of course and for that reason alone the monsters in the second edition monstrous manual are that much tougher um, not all of the monsters but a huge portion of them had increased hit points increased attacks damage etc to compensate for this ability now you could easily just take it out and say we're not using it and your old monster books would be just fine but good luck finding players that really don't want to use that aspect the barbarian was another one of my favorite character classes just because of conan and uh brack the barbarian and so many other uh you know fafford the gray mouser to to uh, uh fafford from fafford and the gray mouser to some extent, I think, was also quite literally a barbarian uh, to some extent, but the Deities and Demigods book didn't have that information yet. They were quite powerful, uh, as they should be, but they also had a tremendous amount of experience points needed to attain levels. 6,000 just to get to second level is, you know, pretty rough. That's, that's like third level for everybody else. The abilities that were given to the ranger were were fine. The uh, the penalties added to the ranger with weapon specialization of which weapons they had to take were a fair trade off, I suppose. Uh, to be honest, uh, it should have been a given. The the more detailed tracking abilities, another fine addition. The Thief Acrobat, while it wasn't one of my favorites or even something I ever even contemplated, was fun for some players. Uh, it just, just you know, the decreased abilities in the actual thieving, uh, you know, abilities just wasn't a fair trade-off for me. But it was nice that they put in the uh, bonuses and penalties for wearing other types of armor. I really, I really thought that was a, a, you know, it was needed. The additional weapons and equipment, also, you know, even though it was just a small amount, it was a nice addition. And, and I'm going to get to the field and full plate armor here, as opposed to later on where it actually appears in the book, uh, because we're talking about weapons and equipment. I absolutely love the idea of armor having hit points. And eventually, you know, obviously, you know, taking damage and falling apart. But I believe that from the very beginning, I've always said that armor does not help, does not make you harder to hit. It makes you harder to damage. And that was, you know, sort of a validation of my thought process. And if you've played other games where armor comes into play in that effect, where it, it stops damage, that's what it does. I own uh, a couple of plate carriers and of uh, various types and they will stop the damage they don't make it easier or make you easier or harder to hit i should say they make you easier to hit unless you're trained to wear such a device uh, especially my steel carrier that that weighs a good 30 pounds i think that's that's added encumbrance and it's definitely going to make you slower it it, it doesn't it, it should actually reduce your your dexterity bonus at the very least and you know add to your inc overall encumbrance which i know it does in i think pathfinder and third edition or something like that which is really how it should be so you know cool on you guys for finally you know coming to the party and getting you know how armor works and to be honest the the full uh, the, the full plate and field plate really should have been in the game from the very beginning how many times have you seen a movie or a story where suits of full plate are standing up, you know, in museums or in castles or things like that? While they would be expensive, I wouldn't make them 
more expensive than the, the game uh, quotes here in this book and I wouldn't limit them to being available only to the Cavaliers and Paladins because lots of people you know would invest in it and it was the ultimate development in armor technology until they stopped using armor because of things like crossbows and, and, and weapons like that. Now, with that said, I'm going to move on to the new spells. You, nobody can complain about having new spells. There's, you, can, uh, you can pick and choose the spells individually, but having new spells is flat out an absolute bonus, and there are far too many new spells to, to go over. There are a couple of notable exceptions, that being Death Store for the Clerics, Aid was another great one, imbued with spell ability, just for, you know, the cleric, I think clerics and druid spells, I don't know if the, they were druid spells, but I know they were cleric spells. The magic spells, Melf's Acid, Arrow, things like that. The cantrips, uh, we, we rarely actually used them, but in retrospect, having one spell slot taken up with, you know, I think it's four, four to one, four cantrips for one first level spell, not a bad idea, especially... If you take some of the untie and unlock, so that if you're ever, you know, captured, thrown in prison, things like that, you've got your built-in sort of thieving abilities, at least one shot of them. Now into the Dungeon Master's section. The, the additional rules for rolling dice is stick with three or four dice and, and just, just stop. Right? The, the, it's just characters whining about not being able to roll up a character. Well, just roll up a bunch of characters and then pick the one you want, I guess. You know, you're going to roll some duds from time to time. Doesn't mean you have to play a crappy character unless the DM says, roll up your character now. You get one shot at it and if it sucks, you know, just die. You know, I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, the henchman and retainer section, nice to, to you know, uh, include that here you know you do have the new character type so you kind of you know need that i guess not that all that many characters eventually got to that point where they had you know followers and retainers and things like that the the section on spell books and a acquisition of cantrips etc uh absolutely must have section it's not very big i think it's one or two pages but it was absolutely needed from the very beginning the 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 entire rules set on spell books was really limited and this just fleshed it out a little bit the spell explanations for the dungeon master absolutely necessary now one of my favorite uh, favorite parts of this book was something that we always wanted and needed which was the social class and rank as well as as well as circumstances of birth whether you were poor or rich at the beginning of the game it, it was always assumed that you were dirt poor maybe a little if you if you rolled high on the starting amount of gold which i think was kind of weak but you know it was a product of its time and they you know, it came kind of from the war gaming mentality. They wanted you to start out with just just enough to get by, just enough to get, get your you know foot in the first dungeon, so to speak. But this really added to the role playing aspect. Where where you come from? Who are your parents? Were they poor? Were they rich? Were they in the middle somewhere? I absolutely despise the racial modifiers because they were based in, in, in a form of racism, which was anti demi human. Uh, there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't accidentally or, you know, get lucky and roll that your parents were from great nobles, sovereign nobility or royalty, being a dwarf or an elf or a gnome for that matter. All those races had those things. But for whatever reason, they said, no, you can never be related to Elrond or, or, or something of that nature. And that's just, well, then humans shouldn't get that either. Uh, why? If you don't want the player characters being related to nobility, it's only going to be a, a benefit to the role-playing aspect as opposed to a detriment. If, if, if you can't handle it, then don't use the chart at all. 
and everybody's dirt poor, and you could run those kind of games. I, I, I've been in plenty of them, and I've ran plenty of them as well. But this just gives just a little bit more flavor and a little bit more backstory without the players just, you know, saying, I want this. Well, no, this is where your parents were, and there's nothing saying you can't increase your social standing through gameplay. How many characters have gone from, you know, first level fighter to a lord? Well, you know, what if he started out with a, you know, 15 or 20 soch and then now he's lord? Well, that, that easily puts him up into the lower upper class, doesn't it? And the circumstances of birth from only child to being the 12th child, I don't understand, you know, other than, you know, fertility rates, why non-humans would get the minuses of up to minus 30, which would mean... Uh, real quick here, that you were the sixth child. Okay, so elves don't have any more than six children. Okay. Um, whatever. I, I, I really have nothing to say on that. Now, the additional magic items and the new treasure tables, I absolutely loved it. Most of the new magic items were actually pretty cool. Now, um, I was watching uh, the old geek... Uh, Wednesday, I think it was, where he was talking about uh, the armor and weapons, specifically the, the pluses and types, and etc., being a little bit too high. Um, I have to kind of agree with him, except when it comes to uh, some of the weapons. They were out there in Dragon magazines and modules and things like that, and that's where they pulled them from. The, 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 the pluses, you just, you know... You kind of have to deal with it. There were already, you know, plus five defenders. So there being plus five or, or plus three or four weapons of other types just made it, you know, nicer for the other character races or professions, excuse me, that, that weren't fighters. Fighters are, are, are the least characters that actually needed pluses to hit. But like right here, the scimitar plus four. You're telling me a druid couldn't actually benefit from that? Especially, you know, later on down the road when they're having to fight, you know, undead and things like that. Uh, speaking of magic items, the Amulet of Undead. Great way to, you know, okay, there's no there's no uh, cleric in the party, but I want to throw undead at you. Well, someone's now become the, the, uh, the party, you know, you know, turning of undead character. That's now your job because you've got that magic item. Different holding devices. I love that. The Quiver of Alona. Uh, now, there were some overpowered magic items in here, but there were some overpowered magic items in the Dungeon Master's Guide. The Rod of Lordly Might, that's the only magic item a fighter would would you know would need for many, many, many levels. And, you know, if, if you don't like a magic item, just don't put it in your game. It's that simple. Reroll or, or what have you. Now, the appendix is... Uh, weaponless combat and non-lethal combat. We had our own system, which was basically just regular combat, and the damage is subdual when the monster is or creature or or you know opponent is at zero. They're knocked out. It's just that simple. The non-human deities. While I rarely use this section, it must have been very helpful for not just the dungeon masters to to have more non-human deities in their in their campaign. But it, it gave the players the opportunity to not have to buy the Deities and Demigods book, but to be able to know a little bit about maybe their chosen deities. The uh, nomenclature of pole arms, long-winded and very rarely used except by the most stalwart fan of pole arms. I, I can only think of a half a dozen characters in my party that ever used anything uh, that wasn't a sword, battle axe, Maybe a halberd from time to time, just because it was, you know, kind of large damage. But for the most part, it was you know swords and shields all the way. But that was the Unearthed Arcana by TSR Hobbies. Uh, I really love this book, but I can see where everything in here, starting with the non-weapon proficiency, excuse me, the weapon proficiencies, non-weapon proficiencies were in the Dungeoneers and Wilderness Survival Guide, which I will be doing. Probably next month, but this was the beginning of the end for first edition. It added so much power, but didn't address the monsters 
and upgrade the monsters. Now the monsters could have been upgraded with a simple, you know, give everything one, two, or three hit points per hit die, and you, you pretty much would have been right back where you started from. Yeah, the players are going to get the extra attacks from time to time, but this was the mechanic that started the end of first edition. And if you, you want to stick to first edition, that's cool. I would just not use the specialization rules and explain to the players, if we use it, I'm going to bump up the monsters. If we don't use it, I can use them as per the book. Choice is yours, or you can do what we did and incorporate the two games, that being first edition and second edition, AD&D, put it, bring them together as one game and use what you want, throw out the rest, pretty much like everybody who's been playing Dungeons & Dragons from the very beginning, take what you like, throw out the rest, make the game your own, and really isn't that what everybody does? Make the game your own, enjoy the heck out of it, and like we always say here at the Shadow and Sun Show, play the games you love with the people you love, and everything's going to be just fine. So until next time, have a great day and an even better weekend. We love you guys. We can't wait to see and hear from all of you over the course of, you know, the rest of our lives. We're, we're all going to have a lot of fun gaming together and talking together. And uh, I'll see you soon. Bye.